Now each year, the American Chemical Society adds another name to the distinguished list of scientists who have received the society's highest honor, the Priestley Medal. Names like Remsen, Noyes, Yuri, Seaborg, and Pauling are just a few of the 75 chemistry luminaries among the recipients. Tonight, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing the most recent person to join the illustrious list of Priestley medalists. This evening, I have the great privilege and pleasure of introducing this year's recipient of the American Chemical Society's highest honor, the Priestley Medal to an ACS colleague and friend I've known for many years, Peter Stang. Peter came to the United States in 1956 as a teenager when his family fled Hungary after the uprising against the Soviet Union. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1962. He earned his undergraduate degree in chemistry from DePaul University in 1963 and his PhD in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley in 1966. After a two-year NIH postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton University, Peter Stang joined the University of Utah faculty in 1969 and became distinguished professor in 1992. He's a past chair of the Department of Chemistry and served as dean of the College of Science for 10 years. He's also an honorary professor of chemistry at the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Chemistry in Beijing, the Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, the East China Normal University, the East China University of Science and Technology, Suzhou University, and Nanjing University of Technology in China. The name Peter Stang is no doubt one of the most recognized in the world among researchers in the field of chemistry. As editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society, Peter's vision and guidance have made JAKS the most cited journal in chemistry and one of the most important and influential. Since taking over the helm of JAKS in 2002, the journal has doubled the amount of manuscripts received, more than doubled annual citations, and achieved a continuous annual increase in impact factor. As one colleague said, Peter Stang has creatively reinvented JAX and expanded its scope and reach. Before being named editor of JAX, Peter was an associate editor of the journal from 1982 to 1999. He also was an editor-in-chief of the Journal of Organic Chemistry from 2000 to 2001. In addition to his ACS journal accomplishments, Peter has a long history of professional service. He currently is a member of the editorial board of Chemical and Engineering News, an ACS counselor for the Salt Lake section, the chair for the upcoming Pacific Chem Conference in 2015, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also is a foreign member of the Chinese, Hungarian, and Russian Academies of Sciences. In 2005, Peter was instrumental in facilitating and arranging meetings between an ACS delegation and high-level Chinese officials of that country's Academy of Sciences, the Ministry of Science and Technology, and National Natural Science Foundation. That initiative has led to an ongoing fruitful collaborative alliance between ACS and the Chinese Chemical Society. Although Peter is often cited for his professional service to chemistry, his research side is equally impressive. Early in his career, he's done seminal creative work in unsaturated reactive intermediates like vinyl cations and extended carbenes, as well as polyvalent iodine chemistry. He's a world leader in organic and materials research and a pioneer in the field of supramolecular chemistry and nanobiological self-assembly. He developed the concept of the directional bonding approach to supramolecular chemistry and was the first to report the structures of self-assembled dodecahedra cube octahedra. He's the author of just over 500 scientific publications. His work in coordination-driven self-assembly has inspired dozens of researchers around the world. The awards Peter has received during his career are reflective of his research excellence. They include the F.A. Cotton Medal for Excellence in Chemical Research, the Fred Basolo Medal for Outstanding Research in Inorganic Chemistry, 
the ACS Award for Creative Research and Applications of Iodine Chemistry, the Linus Pauling Medal, the ACS George A. Ola Award in Hydrocarbon or Petroleum Chemistry, the ACS James Flack Norris Award in Physical Organic Chemistry, and many more. In 2011, Peter received our country's highest honor for scientists, the National Medal of Science. Last year, in recognition of his many outstanding achievements, Peter was also named an ACS Fellow. Tonight, we are pleased to once again celebrate Peter's numerous and exceptional accomplishments. For his distinguished services to chemistry, including cutting-edge research that has far-reaching implications for many areas of science, I'm thrilled to present the ACS's Highness Honor, the Priestly Medal, to Professor Peter J. Stang of the University of Utah. Thank you, President Wu, for this generous introduction. I'm immensely honored, humbled, and grateful to receive the Priestley Medal and be in the company of the previous 76 distinguished recipients with significant, unique contributions to chemistry. It is a special privilege to be listed alongside the late Henry Eyring and Robert W. Perry my former colleagues at the University of Utah, as well as several past editors of the Journal of the American Chemical Society. That list of editors includes my immediate predecessor, Alan J. Bard, as well as author B. Lamb, the sixth editor of JAX from 1918 to 1950, who was the longest serving editor and is also the editor who introduced peer review as we know it. Of course, I must also mention Linus Pauling, who received the Priestley Medal in 1984. Although he was not an editor, he was an outstanding associate editor of JAX for a 10-year period from 1934 to 1943. Before I tell you about my life in chemistry for more than five decades, I would like to congratulate each and every one of my fellow 2013 ACS awardees. <laughs> I also want to express my gratitude to my family, especially my wife Christine, for their unconditional support while I was having all the fun with chemistry. Furthermore, I, I am most grateful to the more than 100 postdoctoral fellows and graduate and undergraduate students to date whose dedication and research accomplishments made this award possible. My sincere thanks also go to my colleagues at Utah for providing an incredibly collegial and supportive environment for my 44 years of independent career in the chemistry department. I'm a German by birth, a Hungarian by upbringing, and a proud American by choice. I was born in Germany to a German mother in 1941 in the midst of the Second World War. But because my father was Hungarian, and at the outset of the war, Hungary was a safer place to be, my family moved to Hungary before I was a year old. I was first exposed to chemistry in the sixth and eighth grades in Hungary as part of general science courses. That prepared me well for a rather rigorous general chemistry course as a freshman in gymnasium, high school in Hungary. 
chemistry not only appealed to me, but I was also able to set up my own laboratory of experiments at home. In the 1950s in Hungary, it was possible even for a young teenager to buy at the local drugstore common chemicals like hydrochloric acid, <laughs> sulfuric acid, sodium hydroxide, sulfur, potassium nitrate, phenophthalein, and many other chemicals. I was able to experiment on my own, including making slow-burning black gunpowder using sulfur, <laughs> charcoal, and potassium nitrate in the correct ratio. I was not very satisfied with the slow-burning nature of this gunpowder. <laughs> So at one point, I added a little magnesium turnings. <laughs> when I lit it, I almost lost my eyesight. A valuable and hard-learned lesson in safety. By my second year in high school, I, pretty, I was pretty sure I was going to be an engineer or scientist, likely a chemist. However, my high school studies in Hungary were interrupted by the Hungarian uprising against the Soviet occupation that started on October 23, 1956. After a few days of heady freedom, the revolution was crushed by the entrance into Hungary of three additional Soviet divisions in early November. On November 19, my parents and two sisters and I decided to leave Hungary and after three days of traveling, including walking the last 15 to 20 miles, mostly during the night, we arrived in a refugee camp in Austria. Although my father only had a sixth grade education because he had spent more than 15 years in the West, he not only spoke Hungarian, but fluent English, French, and German, even some Spanish. With these talents, he soon became a translator in the camp in Austria, processing the refugees. My mother, who had siblings in Germany, would have preferred to stay in Germany. But after extensive family discussions, we decided that if possible, our first choice would be the United States, followed by Canada and Australia. Fortunately, on November 8, 1956, President Eisenhower signed an executive order facilitating the admission of 5,000 Hungarian refugees to the United States. This order was later expanded to 30,000. Because my father spoke English, and by virtue of his position as a translator, our family was one of the first to be processed, and by mid-December 1956, we arrived at Camp Kilmer, a U.S. Army camp in New Brunswick, New Jersey. As my father had a nephew in Chicago who was willing to sponsor us, by early January 1956, we settled in, Ch in Chicago. So in the short space of just two months, I went from a small town in a small Central European country to a major city in the United States. However, Although I was fluent in Hungarian and German, I did not speak English. Nevertheless, my parents were eager that my younger sister and I continue our interrupted education as soon as possible. My father found and enrolled me in the nearest neighborhood high school, DePaul Academy, which happened to be a parochial all-boys high school on the near north side of Chicago. In just three months, I went from a first semester sophomore in gymnasium in Hungary to a second semester sophomore in high school in Chicago. Fortunately, DePaul Academy had excellent classes, classes in mathematics and the sciences, including chemistry. At the end of both my sophomore year and first semester of my junior year, I was near or at the top of my classes in math and science. But due to limited understanding of and ability to speak English, I failed American history and English. <laughs> to try to find out what was going on, the school administrators decided to give me an IQ test. <laughs> I do not remember being told that this test was time limited. Nor had I ever seen a multiple choice exam before, as they did not exist in Hungary in the 1950s. 
My IQ turned out to be 78. <laughs> Not exactly stellar. This had three major impacts on me. First, I'm not a great believer in standardized tests. <laughs> Although they may serve a purpose. Second, in my 40 plus years of teaching, I've never given a multiple choice exam. <laughs> and third, I never had the guts to retake the IQ test for fear <laughs> that the 78 might actually be real. <laughs> Nevertheless, this, despite this minor handicap and initial setbacks, I graduated in the top 10, number nine as I recall, of my high school graduating class in 1959 and in the fall entered DePaul University in Chicago. At DePaul University, I was most fortunate to have as one of my chemistry teachers and mentors, Dr. Robert C. Miller, who gave me the opportunity to do three years of undergraduate research in phosphorus chemistry that gave me a real taste of the thrill of making new, previously unknown compounds and the joy of discovery. He also encouraged me to go to graduate school. Moreover, he explained to my parents and me that not only would we not have to pay to go to graduate school, but that, that I would be paid a reasonable wage and a, as a teaching assistant or research associate. Miller also inspired many first-generation college graduates, including myself, to consider and go to the very best graduate schools in chemistry. In the fall of 1963, I entered UC Berkeley, where under the guidance of Andrew Streichweiser, Jr., I did research on the kinetics and mechanism of boron fluoride alcohol alkylations and obtained my PhD in December of 1966. In June of 1962, I became a proud, naturalized U.S. citizen and thus also became eligible for NSF and NIH fellowships and in fact was an NSF fellow in my last two years at Berkeley. Moreover, I had the pleasure of meeting my future wife, Christine, at UC Berkeley, where she was working on her Master's of Science degree in library science, while I was working on my PhD in chemistry. These were interesting times at Berkeley, with the Vietnam anti-war protests, the 1964 free speech movement, and the occupation of Sproul Hall, just to name a few of the happenings at that great university. However, with dating and working hard in the laboratory on research, I had no time other than as a casual observer for such activities. <laughs> Although I had not decided on an industrial versus academic career during my time at Berkeley, I was strongly leaning towards the latter and hence was interested in postdoctoral opportunities. After some thinking, research, and consultation with Streichweiser, I decided to work with Paul von Rogge Schleier at Princeton. I was awarded an NIH postdoctoral fellowship, and from January 1967 until May of 1969, I was at Princeton. I found a contrast between one of the largest, best, most liberal public institutions and one of the smallest, best, rather conservative private universities, very interesting. <laughs> this was the golden age of physical organic chemistry, and one of the major topics was the ongoing debate between Herbert C. Brown and Saul Winstein on the classical or non-classical nature of the norbornil cation. My relatively minor contribution to this debate was to investigate metoxy groups as probes for delocalized cations and their substituent effects on two norbornil salvolysis rates. As it turned out, the effect of the metoxy group at various positions on the norbornil skeleton was relatively minor on the salvolysis rates of the exo and endo two norbornil tosylates and therefore inconclusive on its effect on the nature of the two norbornil cation due to the positive resonance but negative inductive effect of a metoxy group in saturated carbocation systems. 
However, Schleier also encouraged me to do some independent research on my own ideas. It was in this context that I investigated the preparation of vinyl trifluoromethane sulfonates and obtained evidence for simple alkyl vinyl cation intermediates. This turned out to be the first preparation of vinyl triflates that are of significant current interest in cross-coupling reaction and resulted in my first independent publication as a communication in JAX in 1969. It was time I started my career and in early 1969 I accepted a position as an assistant professor of chemistry effective July 1 at the University of Utah where I have been ever since. I was particularly interested in Utah as it had just attracted Robert W. Perry from the University of Michigan, a distinguished inorganic chemist, founding editor of inorganic chemistry, and in 1982 president of the ACS. Utah also attracted Chavez Walling from Columbia University, a preeminent physical organic chemist, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and editor of JAX from 1975 to 1981. Moreover, in 1968, the chemistry department had just moved into a modern new chemistry building. Utah was a growing department on the move and in fact hired not only Perry and Walling, but seven new assistant professors, as well as Joseph Mickle, the future editor of Chemical Reviews, all in a period of three to four years. With this backdrop, I would like to briefly tell you about three aspects of my involvement in chemistry over nearly five decades. First, the changing nature of chemical research. Second, just a bit about my own research. And third, my experience as an editor. During my graduate studies at Berkeley, my postdoctoral work at Princeton in the 1960s, and approximately the first 20 years of my own independent research at Utah, the vast majority of chemical research was carried out by an individual researcher working on a specific idea with graduate students or postdoctoral associates in academia and perhaps working with a couple of colleagues on a single project in industry. However, the combination of rapid development in sophisticated instrumentation in mass spectrometry, NMR, laser spectroscopy, X-ray structure determination, and of course modern microscopy like AFM and STM, along with new insights and concepts gained over the last two dozen or so years has allowed us to tackle ever more complex and sophisticated ideas. In many, if not most, of these cases, the complex, multifaceted nature of these problems requires collaborations and a team approach. Hence, much of contemporary cutting-edge research involves an extensive interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and team approach. A collaboration may involve colleagues from the same department, or perhaps another institution, or even another country. Just as an, just as an example, my own research in self-assembly that I'll mention next in the last two decades has involved very stimulating and productive collaborations with laser spectroscopists at the University of Michigan to investigate the photophysical properties of our ensembles, mass spectroscopists at the University of Richmond, and experts in beamline techniques in Korea to do proper structural characterization. These collaborations have also involved experts in sophisticated computational chemistry in Dalian, China, and experts in AFM and STM in Beijing, China, to investigate the surface deposition and properties of self-assembled molecules. Such a collaborative and interdisciplinary approach, of course, requires the ability to communicate complex topics to non-experts and to learn new science and technology outside of one's training and background. This is both a challenge and fun for not only the research mentor, but also his or her students, postdocs, and co-workers. In fact, as discussed in the report, 
on advancing graduate education in the chemical sciences, which was commissioned by 2012 ACS President Bassam Shakashiri. This approach is well suited and necessary to educate and train the contemporary workforce in the chemical sciences for successful academic as well as industrial careers. Such a multidisciplinary and team approach is important not only in modern basic research leading to new knowledge, but even more so in research directed towards solving important societal needs, for example in health, security, defense, climate change, energy, and other global challenges, all of which involve chemistry. As far as I can tell, this multidisciplinary and team approach to research will only increase as time goes on. Let me turn to my own research. For the first half of my career of independent research, I was involved in classical physical organic chemistry and the study of reactive intermediates, such as vinyl cations and unsaturated carbenes, as well as alkyl fe alkynyl phenyl iodonium salts. For about the last two decades, my research has been in the area of self-assembly. Self-assembly is the spontaneous reaction and organization of simple building units into well-defined, more complex ensembles based upon the recognition elements embedded in the building units. Nature is the supreme and consummate master of self-assembly by adroitly exploiting a multitude of non-covalent weak interactions such as hydrophobic, hydrophilic, van der Waals, pi-pi stacking, dipole-dipole, electrostatic, and hydrogen bonding effects to enable countless biological processes. All living organisms, from the simplest to humans, depend upon molecular self-assembly. Protein folding, nucleic acid structure, ribosomes, chromosomes, and phospholipid membranes are representative examples of self-assembly in nature that are of critical importance in living organisms. The protein coats of viruses encasing their genetic material consist of self-assembled capsids resembling polyhedra such as dodecahedra and icosahedra. Many attempts to mimic nature's elegant self-assembly primarily with hydrogen bonds were met with limited success, particularly in the formation of large, complex, finite assemblies with well-defined shapes and sizes due to the lack of directionality of weak interactions and the necessity of precisely positioning many of these interactions to obtain functional assemblies. In contrast, the use of coordination chemistry and dative metal ligand bonds circumvents these concerns as they are highly directional because of the geometry of the d orbitals involved. Moreover, third row metal ligand interactions have bond energies in the range of 15 to 25 kilocalories per mole, much less than covalent bonds of about 60 to 120 kilocalories per mole, but stronger than the weak interactions of half to 12 kilocalories per mole. Hence, the kinetics of coordination bond formation may be modulated, resulting in reversible self-repairing superstructures under thermodynamic control. Furthermore, by virtue of its higher strength, one dative metal bo ligand bond can replace several hydrogen bonds in the self-assembly process. In the past two decades, we have developed and exploited the use of coordination chemistry and dative metal ligand interactions to self-assemble a wide variety of large, nanoscale, complex, two- and three-dimensional assemblies with well-defined shapes and sizes. In the mid-1990s, we pioneered and developed a systematic, rational, and predictive methodology that has been termed the directional bonding approach for the design and self-assembly of nanoscale metallocycles and metallic cages with pre-designed shapes and sizes. The versatility of this directional bonding approach allows the same methodology employed for the formation of simple two-dimensional systems such as rectangles and triangles 
to be, to be applied to more complex structures such as cuboctahedron and dodecahedron. This and related methodologies have been widely used by numerous researchers worldwide to prepare a large number of diverse metallocycles and cages of various shapes and dimensions. Coordination-driven self-assembly rep represents a bottom-up methodology for the formation of nanoscale complex species of considerable potential significance in modern nanotechnology. To date, such coordination-driven self-assembled ensembles have, been, have found applications as molecular flasks for the observation of unique chemical phenomena and unusual reactions such as supramolecular catalysis, enzyme mimics, and targeted drug delivery systems. Most recently, self-assembled ruthenium rectangles and cages have shown promising in vitro anti-tumor activity comparable to or better than the commercially widely used cisplatin or doxorubicin. Finally, I would like to say a few words about being an editor. Since January 2002, I've had the privilege of being the 12th editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society, which we all know as JACS. I previously served as an associate editor for nearly 20 years. JAX was established in 1879 and is the flagship journal of the American Chemical Society. JAX publishes basic, not applied, cutting-edge research in all areas of the chemical and related sciences. An indication of the tradition of excellence and stature of JAX is that essentially every Nobel laureate in chemistry since about the 1950s has published at least some, if not all, of their seminal work on which the Nobel Prize was based in JAX. Further indication of the high regard for JAX by the chemical co community is the fact that wherever I travel in the world, but particularly in Asia, I receive exceptional hospitality. It, not, it did not take me long to figure out that this is not due to my good looks <laughs> or my magnetic personality or even my cutting-edge science, but rather to being the editor of JAX. I'm proud of the fact that since I took over in 2002, manuscript submissions to JAX have doubled from just under 6,000 in 2001 to just over 12,000 in 2011, the last year for which we have complete data. Our acceptance rate has declined during the same period from about 45% to 26%. It is my goal in the next couple of years to accept only the top 20% of manuscripts received. Likewise, the total annual citations per year for JAX has doubled from just under 200,000 a year in 2001 to just over 400,000 in 2011. In terms of total annual citations per year, the more than 408,000 citations in 2011 puts JAX in the company of the top half a dozen science journals, such as Nature, Science, PNAS, and the Journal of Biochemistry. All of this, of course, is the result of the effort and dedication of the JAX team of 25 associate editors, the managing and assistant managing editors, the office staff, and the incredibly efficient production group in Columbus, Ohio, and the leadership of the ACS Publications Division in Washington, D.C. I should add that not only have the manuscript submissions and annual citations of JAX doubled in the past decade, but as our acceptance rate has steadily declined, so have the phone calls from unhappy authors <laughs> whose manuscripts did not make it into JAX. Moreover, unfortunately, in many instances, these phone calls have become several factors more ordinary. It is, of course, my task as editor to thoughtfully and diplomatically address not only the pleasant but also the unpleasant aspects of this important position. I hope I have done so. Allow me to illustrate dealing with issues 
with a couple of examples. As an associate editor of Jax in the 1980s, I handled all of Herbert Brown's Jax manuscripts <laughs> in the area of physical organic chemistry. For reasons I no longer remember, I sent one of his communications to three rather than the more customary two reviewers. All three came back requesting minor changes and recommending acceptance. I mailed the reviews to Brown along with my letter that I shall be happy to accept it subject to his consideration of the reviewer's comments. When Herb received this, I immediately received a phone call from him along the lines, Peter, does Jack have double standards? I responded, what do you mean, Herb? He said, for Nobel laureates, you have to have three reviews, two are not sufficient. <laughs> I knew Herb quite well, as his only son Charles and I overlapped in graduate school at Berkeley. So I just held the phone and let him talk. <laughs> then I said, Herb, how is Charlie doing? <laughs> we spent a pleasant five or ten minutes talking about Charlie. Herb seemed to have forgotten why he called, <laughs> and all was well. When Al Bard became editor of Jax in 1982, by policy he could not handle any manuscript submitted from University of Texas, Austin, nor could his associate editor in theoretical chemistry, who was a colleague of Bard's at the time. Hence, I ended up handling the submissions of Michael J.S. Dewar, a preeminent theoretician and experimental physical organic chemist and colleague of Bard. One day I received a phone call from Michael during which he accused me of giving him the worst editorial treatment in his career. Needless to say, I was surprised and upset. So as soon as our conversation ended, I called Al Bard and told him what happened. When Al found out who it was, he told me not to worry. Michael says the, the same thing to all editors he deals with. When Don Trullar became the associate editor for, theoretical, for the theoretical area in 1984, much to my relief, all Dewar manuscripts were handled by him. <laughs> However, after a couple of years, Dewar stopped into Bard's office and said, I don't want Trullar to handle my manuscripts. I want Stang to process them. <laughs> I guess I may not have given him the worst editorial treatment after all. <laughs> I would like to end by thanking my country of choice, the United States of America, for affording me the opportunity to go, to go from a homeless refugee in 1956 to a priestly medalist in 2013, and in the process achieve the American dream. <clears throat> I'm convinced that despite the current economic and budgetary issues, the United States will remain the leader in the sciences and especially chemistry and the desired destination of the best minds in the world for some time to come. Finally, I would like to thank you, thank all of you for your very kind attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare this meeting adjourned.